way and the other. That's a massive transportation system. I was telling yesterday at the city hall that when we were working with the people from Poma, French company that won the, the open bidding competition for the contract, they were saying they were saying that it, it was the first time in their corporate history that they were building these systems not for uh, getting to our ski resort or the natural site, but as a massive transportation system. Community and uh, how is their involvement in this kind of moment? Yeah. Mm. When I talk about civil society, I, I, uh, encamp I, I, I encompass all community and uh, NGO. But what I, what I would say is that urban uh, social urbanism was all about participation. Different levels of participation depend on the, on the program of the project. For example, the library project. Deciding, what, deciding whether the library park was going to be built or not was not a participatory project. But deciding what to put in it, it was. Uh, sometimes deciding to build a park, it was part of community, community initiative. Many, many of those parks were built because of community initiative. We also did something that I didn't mention, I mentioned it yesterday uh, in the planning department of the city of Toronto, is that we created our own participatory budget program. We built upon the Brazilian model, a participatory budget, and we created our own model. And that helped us to uh, complement and to reach many of those spaces. So community were in the center and community participation in design, in administration, and in enriching the places of Western Mexico. Thank you. For um, hi, everyone. My name is Nico. I really appreciate your talking as a, as a fellow Colombian. I, I truly admire all the work that Medellin has done. I am particularly from, Colombia, from Bogota, uh -huh. who has a lot of other social issues. Um, but I want to raise the issue growing up, um, the safety. Safety is primarily one of the biggest things when a family contemplates going out for a picnic. Um, or contemplates out for using any urban social space. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the context of, of Toronto, for instance, that it tends to be a little bit more accessible, where that concern isn't really applied as to, you know, whether I'm going to this place, is it safe or not, right? So I just wanted to know if, if maybe you can expand on this idea of safety in, in using the social fabric between um, in your example of the comunas, if you can expand you know, the bridge between the two of them and how safety plays its role in developing uh, like a community resilience and, mm -hmm. and developing that community uh, or, or enhancing the, the, the community experience. Well, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Remember the two trees. One of those trees was violence in a white perspective. Not only homicide, but violence. And the other one is inequality. I didn't explain, I think I can like, elaborate a little bit more. And we work all together with the police and the justice system to pull out the tree of violence. And any even small advance we make in that respect open up the possibility to invade for, for, uh, that neighborhood with social interventions and opportunities and programs and mm -hmm. cultural spaces and ed for educational spaces. So, um, I would say that was something more integral. Because what we think is that safety doesn't come out from police only. It comes out from people occupying the space. And I was telling um, tomorrow that, and yesterday that uh, I am surprised of how dark are the streets of Toronto, for example. The, the public lighting. Yeah. We have a much better public lighting system for our public spaces and our streets. And that, I think, is just to give you a single, a single example, gives you more sense, a, a better sensation of safety, security. Just to give you, well, it's not, I don't have a magic formula. What I can say is that now we manage to take people out from their places, out from their neighbors, and, and visit all these, all these uh, educational and cultural facilities. Uh,
safety is, of course, an ongoing job. We have to do things regarding that every day. And now, we have new challenges. In the 90s, we were a, a society that exported drugs. Now, we are having the problems that any other developed city or developing world city has. We have micro-trafficking, and that generates a new, a new issue to solve. So, well, that's not an answer, but that's an approximation of an answer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but because, because there's no magic formula for that. But I think it's, uh, it's about uh, tackling the problem from different perspectives and understanding the context of every neighborhood that you're intervening. Thank you. Yes, uh, so much has changed in Colombia since I first started to visit in the early 90s. And my question is, what was the spark that, that that started this change and how was it able to, to come about not only in Medellin but also in Bogota? I, I would say that good mm, policy and, and social change has no parts. Of course it has catalyzers and I mentioned politics. I think good politics, not only in Medellin but at the national level, uh, has something to do with it. But I would say that mm, many of my fellow politicians would say that I'm wrong that everything began when they arrived to office. But I would say I, I have to, to pay homage to people in different levels, community levels, uh, neighborhood NGOs, uh, think tanks, corporate uh, or business sector that remain trusting and believing that Medellin and Colombia could do better and remain doing their things, whether I'm talking about art, culture, business, whatever, thinking, writing, even in our direst moment. So I think we were resilient as a society because we were like mm, having a, an active resistance to that kind of trouble we were living in. So then politics opened a door. That it opened a window that many of, of us, I was a student leader at the time. My father was killed in 1992 and I decided to stay. And when I saw a decent, uh, com committed politician entering into the public arena, that how difficult that is, I decided to work with him and put all my energy in my life uh, to improve the quality of living and the chances of my fellow citizens. So politics were important. But it happened because many people were resistant from 1960 to the 2000. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I recognize that um, you had great motivation in the city. Mm -hmm. um, I recognize and agree completely that politicians making decisions is incredibly important. How did you get them to make decisions that quickly and act on them that quickly? Politicians. Well. My case was different because I was part of the political group. Yeah? But I, I can tell you that uh, the role of politics in our case, uh, and remember context, I'm not going to translate this to your context. In our context, uh, a group of people with ideas, knowing nothing about politics, at the time that was very important. Because if we were more informed about the difficulties and the challenges and how difficult it was, Probably, I, I wouldn't be here showing you this set of programs and transformations. But that idealistic group did something amazing. Now, our challenge, I didn't tell you, that now we, we govern for eight years the city, and for four more years the state, our province, and now we, in the last election, they kicked us out of both positions. So now we are reflecting, what did we, what did we do wrong? Probably we didn't manage to connect, to institutionalize, to create a party, to create something that could last. And now, since we are young and we have time, we are trying to do something different and even thinking about going again to the national level. But we failed regarding well, the continuity or, or improvement of this program. So, well, in our case, it was from the political side that we decided to implement this program. And we seduced and we convinced, and we came everyone on board. No left, no right, just the product of the city, but that was in our context. 
Remember our pilot. It was easy. This was like the Arch of Noah. Yeah? It was easy to put lions and birds on the same bus, on the same place, at that time. Now, we are facing new challenges, and we have political, political instability, and we have parties, and, and now we are not in power. Now we have to do our contribution from the outside, and that's new challenge. Anyone else? Um, first of all, thank you for sharing your incredible story and experience. It's amazing. Um, and including the challenges, really appreciate hearing all of it. Um, I have a question about how you managed to activate uh, the citizens of the community to participate in uh, envisioning uh, the transformation. How, how do you get people who are just concerned with their safety and with feeding their children and just dealing with life to actually actively participate in, uh, in reimagining their, their community. Mm -hmm. Several factors. First, trust in government. They knew that we were spending every cent of the public money on this work. Below every project, the works, you'll see the cost, the schedule, the contractor, how the process was, the, the contracting process was, and uh, we were explaining to them uh, the second part. We were communicating permanently, transparently, actively, uh, by different means, on the local television, using leaflets, uh, radios, uh, using our radio to communicate. And we were like making people share this vision, like by seducing, by transmitting our passion for the city. For example, our process of communicating a library part didn't begin the, on the inauguration. It began three years before. We were sitting right there. I remember that night, one night, in the Comuna Plaza Library, uh, library part. We were in the local television, sitting in a plot. There was a mule behind us, I think. We were like, uh, weeds everywhere, and we were saying with a whiteboard, you cannot imagine how beautiful it's going to be the library park we're going to have here. <laughs> and we were interviewing people from the community and asking them broadcast live about their dreams on the library park. So first, trust. Second, communi active communication. And, uh, and third, I would say consistency. That has to happen every single day, every single week for the whole administration. If you fail once, you always will cost. Three factors at least. That. And then I also tell you that most of the people that participated in our process were were being getting ready for that for years. They were waiting eagerly for an invitation to participate because of the kind of crisis we did. That's a positive side of resiliency. There are many people working, hoping to be invited to the process. So that's why I always go back to the context. Our context was different. We have lots of people wanting to be invited to participate. So that's why we have this kind of political movement with civic leaders, business people, regardless of the ideology. But that was our case. Uh, I am Adi from Fraga. Uh, what do you mean, uh, so, sorry, uh, what is the difference with uh, social urbanism, urbanism and sustainability? Thank you. Social urbanism is about transforming the lives of people for better. That's social urbanism. When I, when I was uh, comparing social urbanism with other urbanisms, I was remembering other cases in my city and in other cities I, I, I had visited or read about them that are projects of urban change, but they don't put the people in the, in the center. They think about economic recovery, or they think about urban design or architectural design, and that's fine, but you cannot design for a picture, and you cannot design for corporation. That, that's what I think. That's what you think of you have to design a route for the people who live in this. Not to displace them. That's what I was trying to, to transmit. 
and sustainability, my perspective was about uh, making all these projects and programs and facilities and parts, whatever, whichever department I'm talking about, to be sustainable from a multidimensional perspective of sustainability, environmental, financial, community, political, uh, many, many sides of sustainability. And by sustainability, what I mean is the same thing that you even says. Like, work today and be able to work and operate in the future, successfully, having social impact. For me, sustainability in the uh, science part is thinking that it has to be a vibrant mm -hmm. living organization, not only a building. A living organization that can get private, can get private money or public money and that can create new exhibits every year and be environmentally friendly and uh, be financially viable and uh, be every year more and more seductive for the visitors. That's what I mean by the same thing. Uh, my question is about the governance model that you put between the politicians and the public on a big project that's transformational like this. You had transit, you had parks, you had libraries, you had schools, um, you had the police involved. How do you get all of those governmental silos to play nicely with one another and make this kind of change happen? Here in Toronto, mm -hmm. our parks and our recreation report to two different committees at City mm -hmm. Hall. Mm -hmm. how, how do you make the kind of change you made with all of those different groups within the bureaucracy? Uh, from my perspective, it's like two questions in one. But I'm going to try to address both. First, uh, the way we did the project was like uh, throwing down the walls between the silos we were talking about. An integral project like the one I mentioned in the northeastern area of Medellin had to do with the Secretary of Infrastructure, of Health, of Education, Culture and Arts, uh, uh, participation, like 10 members of the cabinet. You know members of the cab of a cabinet are usually mortal enemies among them? Yes. So what we decided is that the project was more important than power of the members of the cabinet. And we created a PMO, a project Man management office, at the private secretary, my my office at the time. And we had like a general manager for the whole project. And the secretaries of the different uh, uh, areas or silos uh, were invited to the board. But it was like turning backwards the structure of the municipality. Not uh, of the, we, we didn't want the success of each area separately, but the success of the integral project. So they were part of the board, but we had an exclusive, an exclusive team for each one of the projects. That was the crucial for the, for the execution. And on the other hand, I think you were asking about the possibility to uh, make uh, or invite people and organizations from the civil sector and other sectors uh, to work with us. I think the first thing that's fundamental is generosity. For example, I told you about the botanical Garden and Park, yes? We invested like 10 million of American dollars. When I say we, it's the city work. So we had the opportunity to kick out from the foundation because they didn't have money, the Gardeners Club, the Orchid Society, the Environmental Authority, and the Society of Public Improvement, all of them NGOs. And you know what we did? We invited them to be part of the board. And we decided that despite of us being investing 99% of the money of the project, we were going to have minority in the board. That builds trust. And now, uh, that helped us in the future with the, the sustainability chapter. Because when a mayor, eventually a different mayor, decided that he wanted someone from the mining sector, gold mining, be the general manager of the botanical garden, that was like a heresy. <laughs> the private sector, the social sector, those NGOs said, Mr. Mayor, you can recommend anyone you want, but that person has to know about education, 
environment or whatever we do in this botanical garden. Yeah? So he, he wasn't able to change the general manager for the botanical garden. He got mad with us for a year. Uh, because I was part of the board from the civil society, yeah, on behalf of the civil society. Uh, uh, he got mad with us and he didn't give us money for a couple of well, semesters. And then he realized that the botanical garden was very important for the city and a great ally for the municipality. And now we've been doing well with him for the last three years. That's, a, that's a, an example of working together work with uh, other sectors. Thank you. I think we have just time for one more question, but I know it's going to be around with the mixer later on, too. If you have some questions, you can talk to them then. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I wanted to point out, like, you had, like, seven different factors mm -hmm. for the different projects, and one of the last ones was on sustainability mm -hmm. and making sure the project is good long-term. So maybe you could share a bit more perspective on how to find the balance between a being sure that it's financially stable, but you're still serving um, underserved populations or underserved areas. Yes, what we did is what I call like an investment banking, but social. The whole idea was to think about sustainability from the scratch, not when you inaugurate the museum or the park or the school. And I have to say that there's no one size fits all solution. For every single project, we ask ourselves the question about sustainability. And design for them, we have several different models of sustainability to address that question. But all of them had to have in the center that the social mission of the program couldn't be perverted or changed. So in some cases, like the schools, the sustainability model is more about the private sector, the universities, and international community supporting the public school and the public servants as a, as a principal. That's a public uh, state model of sustainability with help from other sectors. The cases of Explora Park, the museum and science park, is like in the other side of the spectrum. It's, it's an NGO and a botanical garden. There are independent NGOs with participation, minority, minority participation of the government. Uh, but they all had to be uh, focused on the, on, the, um, on the original population we were trying to serve. For example, the Explora Park, we charge uh, for the entrance to the people who can pay. But the poorest people of Medellin, they don't pay. They show up their utility bill, and it, the thing is that depends, in Medellin depends on where you live, you pay different rates for your utility, it's like a, a subsidized, yeah? So you show, you show your utility bill, and that's like a pass, if you are from the lower level, socioeconomically speaking, of the society, you can enter the Museum of Science for free. But if you're a tourist like you, you'll pay 20 bucks. Please, go and pay. 